I'm Dan O'Neill, a biologist and filmmaker, and I'm on a mission to find out what it takes to save an endangered species. <coughs> Join me on an expedition to the mountains of Kyrgyzstan as I learn firsthand how this country has brought snow leopards back from the brink. This is tough work. Look how clean that is. In this episode, I head up into the mountains of the Sarichat Reserve with a real adventure scientist. He's going to show me what snow leopard conservation means to the people who live in these remote regions and to see what it takes to gather data on an almost invisible big cat. It's like a ghost of the mountains. I think it's a phantom who's there, but you never see it. We're in Bishkek, uh, and we're just about to meet uh, Kuban Jumabai Ulu, who is the director and founder of the Snow Leopard Foundation here in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, him and I have been speaking kind of on and off for about a year, a year and a half now, about getting out here and doing an expedition together to set camera traps and hopefully see a snow leopard in the wild. Hi. Hi, Kuban. How are you? Good. Come. How are you? Very good, thank you. I'll see you. Come, come, please. Chang. Here you can see how many individuals we identified. And uh, every since. single one of these is a different snow leopard? Yeah, these are different snow leopards. So we try to find good images of each individual from James, both sides. James yeah, Bond. James Bond. Jessica Alba. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a selfie with this snow leopard. You had a selfie with that cat? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. How many have you seen in the wild? Uh, With your own see, eyes? Three times. Three times. Three times. Then you know that it's very hard to find this mm -hmm. animal in the wild. You know? I, mean, I mean, they see us first. You know that they are around, and then they are very well camouflaged, so it's hard to find them. People say that it's the wildlife encounter that you can have. Um, so yeah, well, it's been my dream for a very, many, very long time. And I think you'll find it. Chances are high. I'm going to hold you to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, nice. Okay. Well, I can see you've planned it all out over here already. Yeah. So I was working on these locations where we set up camera traps, and then I want to show this map to the rangers. And some cameras, you know, when setting up, you have to change the angle because animals come, but you can't get exact spots, you know, which are important for identification of individuals. So every coat is like a fingerprint. Effectively. Yeah, it's like that. Yeah. So they have unique patterns on the and then this helps us, you know, to identify. You've been camera trapping for, what, seven years in this yeah, reserve? Yeah, yeah. Why do you do it? What are well, you hoping to achieve? So we are comparing data from this area with the other area where there is no reserve, how big area is needed for one individual. We see how they share this habitat with other animals. So we see how many females give birth, how they share this uh, area, how many cubs Stay with his mother two years ago. The scale of the task which Kuban and his team are undertaking is starting to dawn on me. This animal is virtually impossible to observe, but with methodically collected camera trap evidence, Kuban is building up a robust scientific picture of where these ghost-like cats live in Kyrgyzstan. Nice one. <laughs> so, at 5 a.m., we pack up and set off. Can move it. We're going, we're going. I'm in safe hands. Kuban has made the journey into the reserve more than 50 times. As we leave the city, I feel proud and excited to be a small part of something much larger than my own goal of seeing a snow leopard. But I wonder what chance I have. Even Kuban, who's dedicated seven years of his life to seeing these animals, has only seen them three times. It's weird, isn't it? I wanted to see a snow leopard for years, for years. Probably ever since I was a little kid and I first saw one, I thought it was a, a picture of something that wasn't real, um, a made up animal. And as you kind of dream of becoming a wildlife filmmaker and a biologist, the snow leopard's pretty much the one animal that you really never think you're going to be able to see because who really gets to go into those mountains? Um, and now we're looking at them <laughs> with our own eyes, right up there. 
The foothills of the colossal Tian Shan mountain range finally show themselves and we begin our climb into this remote landscape. It's not long before we reach the front line of snow leopard conservation. <laughs> We're in a wildlife check post, so people coming out of the reserve. They drive through here, they have to stop, and then these guys search all the vans and the cars for wildlife parts. She's really, really Hello! She's a badass, isn't she? Uh, her name is Chili, and she uh, knows the snow leopard smell and uh, our galleys, ibex smells. And we, when the uh, suspicious cars comes and uh, I work with the chili and she uh, looks around the car and tries really? to find a, uh, that things. Does she know the difference between Argali or Snow Leopard? Yeah, she knows. Really? Definitely. definitely. Sometimes uh, some people text me uh, by bringing some horns of the uh, Argalis or Ibex. And, and she finds really <laughs> yeah oh wow snow leopards share these huge ranges with remote villagers and herders so global or national conservation means nothing if the local people aren't on board snow leopards have been known to kill sheep and goats belonging to these people Yet Kuban is a welcome face in this isolated village. He takes me to meet the people, to see how a local scheme, which the Snow Leopard Foundation have come up with, works. Welcoming you to this place. Thank you very much. Thank you for welcoming us into your home. So, what's this meeting about today? Together with this community, we, uh, we made a local protected uh, which borders with the uh, Sarchat Tertash Reserve. Mm -hmm. And if there is no poaching by local people on prey species and smaller parts, then they get additional uh, bonus from our organization. So there was no poaching on smaller parts, no poaching on uh, wild prey. So I want to pass this money now to our uh, local leader, Chopon. Mm -hmm. And she's going to so this is primarily because of handicraft? <laughs> yeah, yeah, one answer, one answer. So, they are protecting this area well. Now you can come out from this village and see Argalis on mm. the slopes. That's no? amazing, so yeah. it's a real, actual monetary value yes. Yes. associated with conservation. Yes. Um, and does most of the money come from creating these handicrafts? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> And it's just struck me how amazing this is because it's a resource they wouldn't otherwise be using. It's hard wool they don't usually use. And they're turning that non-usable resource into something to create handicrafts that then the Snow Leopard Trust are selling all around the world, giving them direct income. And the arrangement and the agreement they have is that they get this income and they get this collaboration with the Snow Leopard Trust because they're protecting this environment. Which to me is amazing because in all conservation agreements and most conservation um, initiatives, there's always some kind of sacrifice. But here, there's no sacrifice whatsoever because these women who wouldn't typically be making their own income here now have their own source of income, creating these handicrafts, which are then being sold by the Snow Leopard Trust all around the world, uh, making a pretty good income for them. Th these guys made 15,000 US dollars last year in these handicrafts alone, which are made of wool products that they would have otherwise been throwing away. It's a wool that they can't make clothes out of, it's too hard and so yeah I think it's an incredible initiative can't believe it back on the road we need to reach the rangers cabin before nightfall these rangers are locals too many of their families make crafts for the snow leopard truss like we saw in the village as night falls so does the temperature these are brutal conditions. If your car is broken and if you, if you stay in that place and if you don't have any heating inside, I think you'll die. 
if you have no petrol to heat inside, no gas stove, then I think you will die. Just crossed a river, a frozen river, and a very heavy jeep. After 14 hours, we finally reach the cabin where we'll spend the night. <laughs> Welcome to Hotel California. <laughs> it immediately strikes me just how tough these rangers need to be, working with limited provisions and equipment in one of the harshest environments on Earth. Luckily for us, they arrived earlier and have lit a fire, taking the edge off the minus 15 conditions. Well, we're yeah, 4,028 meters. Never been this high up before. And I'm starting to get a bit of a headache and feeling very lightheaded. It's freezing cold. Um, I really do feel like we're on top of the world, but it does feel amazing. It's a completely different type of remote, something I've never experienced before. Um, and it's weird to think that actually there's a lot of wildlife here. There's bears, there's wolves, and somewhere there are snow leopards. We all try to get some sleep. Seeing how the local economy is supported is a vital part of the story here in Kyrgyzstan. But if you can't prove an animal exists, you can't save it. Join me next time as I explore the wild and remote kingdom of the snow leopard, and I learn how to set camera traps that capture the secret lives of these ghostly cats.